Greetings, one and all. It is I, G minus. You can call me G minus Mark or anything really. I'm not going to hear you, am I? Um, so, what I'm going to talk about today is it, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart, and it's a topic that I had to think long and hard how to present because it's there are so many. It's such a multifaceted story. Multifaceted is that a word? That um. <clears throat> There's many directions I could go with it, but the direction I've gone, I've chosen to go, is to explain to people who may not know or only may be partially aware what it is I refer to and people who were around collecting rockabilly in the 70s and 80s. And, you know, past that and prior to that. No, well, not prior to that. Um, refer to as Marianos. Um, I'm not going to go into the full history of who Marianos were. There were two of them, um, two brothers. One of them is still alive, and it's not a secret, I mean, who he is. But I feel that, um, you know, without his permission or, you know, anything like that, I'd rather not talk about the person. I'd rather just talk, explain to you what they are. And I'm going to do that. And while I do that, what I've chosen to do is there were many, many Marianos. In brief, it was a bootleg. And they were called Marianos because they were made by a couple of people whose last name was Mariano. And I've chosen to dig out, there were so many, I've dug out my colored wax rockabilly ones. And I'll explain why they were colored wax while kind of doing things like showing you some examples. So this is a Mariano. It has the same labels in many cases, but not in all cases, as an original. This particular one is, this is a rarer edition. Mostly they press black wax and they were distinguishable. It's probably not something you're gonna be able to see if I try and show the camera. But what distinguished them was they had written in the dead wax, issued, this one for instance says issued 1973. So that was a way of distinguish, distinguishing them from uh, fire distinguisher, uh, distinguishing them from an original. There's a few different examples. I what I've always what I always did for years is I bought the whichever ones I could get the black wax or I preferred the colored wax myself because as a kid when I started collecting them they just looked cool. And um, what I've done over the years is as I've replaced them with originals, I only kept the colored wax ones. I didn't see the point in keeping a black wax one that looks the same as an original, but I can't resist keeping these. Now, let's talk a little bit about the time period and where we got them from. For me, the very first batch of Marianos that I bought came from a list that I was recommended around 19, late 78, 79. It was the first time I'd ever sent away for some Rockabilly records. And my friend Gordon had only recently gotten into Rockabilly and I'd been buying things he'd recommended down the local store like CBS Rockabilly, MCA Rare Rockabilly, MGM Rockabilly, the Johnny Burnett album, all the kind of things you could buy in the 70s in your high street store. And um, he said, hey, here's a list you should send away to this place because they've got some great Rockabilly records you could buy. I might have asked him about a single he had or something. And um, I was given a couple of addresses. One was Rockin' Records, which I think was in Penge, if I remember rightly. And the other was Moondogs Records, which at that time was run by Paul Sanford, who eventually sold the store to Farney Kumis, who kept it as Moondogs Records, and then got sold to Chris Giles and became the Elvis shop. I don't know what happened to it now. So anyway, um, sorry, losing thread there for a second. I first got a list from Moondogs Records and on that they advertised a rockabilly section with 45s. And what was absolutely perfect for me at the time was that they put comments beside each track. So although I didn't know many of the tracks listed, it would say things like, these are a couple of blues ones, by the way, we're just kind of flicking, flacking, flacking. It's very tongue tied today. Um, but they would have comments. So it would say something like, for instance, well, here's a good one. 
say they had Corky Jones, fuck Owens of course, hot dog, it would say Corky Jones, hot dog, pep, killer rockabilly, fabulous guitar break, you know, Bakersfield killer, buy or die. It would say something like that and I go, oh, well, that sounds great. So I think it was coming up to, it was either Christmas or my birthday. I wanna guess that it was, I'm gonna say it was March of 1979. Because I've been hanging around with those guys for a few months and I know we went to see Bill Haley the month before and that was probably about the time I was given the list and my birthday was in March it would have been my uh, 13th in 79 something like that and I requested like 10 singles which would have probably been about they would have been about one pound 25 each so it would have been about only about 11 25 not bad parents getting away with that amount I didn't need a pony or a happy sweet 13th or anything but um, I got the list and I picked out a bunch of titles things like love me by the phantom and cool off baby by Billy barracks and anything that they said was fabulous and when they arrived I was mesmerized and a couple of them were colored wax and I remember just when you hold them up to the light and you look through them and when you're that age everything is magical I would play both sides ballad rocker it didn't matter I mean to me if I owned a record you were supposed to completely play both sides just why to this day I still know all the I can give me two seconds of any ballad or bad country record on the flip of Mariano I know it so I got them and the first thing I remember saying when I opened them to my dad was they had no middles because of course you know I, I grew up in England and British pressings all had centers and if they didn't have a center it'd been punched out so I was confused by that and I said to my dad I said well, you know, what's with and he looked he was confused as well and he said well these must be jukebox records so I kind of went with that for a while and started collecting these not really knowing anything except that they were reissues or bootlegs I didn't know too much about them and um, it wasn't until a, probably about 1981 I started hanging out with a guy who was a couple of years older than me called Steve Matthews who lived just up the road from me and he was a very knowledgeable guy I was very into rockabilly and he was into rockabilly then Ooh, and do what so he kind of turned me on to the harp tones and the five keys before they got super popular and Aladdin and all that kind of stuff. So that was really cool. And one thing we started doing as soon as he got his driving license, I would have been 15 maybe and he would have been 17. Actually, I would have been 14 because as soon as he got his license, I remember we, we hit the road. <clears throat> as we went to Chicken Shack Market which was in, sorry, Chicken Shack Records, which was in Kensington Market in London. And that was the first place that I saw these on the shelf where you could buy them because they were the stockest. And that place was a little tiny, I'll try and put a photograph on the, um, what do you call it? The, the, the thing, you know, the title page. Um, they would have all over the walls all these Marianos. Now they specialized in doo-wop and R&B, but they had the rockabilly ones as well. So they would have mostly the doo-wop and R&B with a smaller section of rockabilly. <coughs> but I happily bought doo-wop and R&B as well. You would go in there and they had this sort of 70s kind of sound system and they played it really loud and everything they played sounded incredible. I remember hearing for the first time the, the James Quintet pars in the kitchen and they're just thinking this is the best thing I've ever heard um, and they had a box now even then like 1981 as early as that they had a box of deleted and rarer Marianos and that was only a few years after the, the time period this is my favorite one come on check this out by the way, just to stop and say something about these multicolored ones. So what they did is they pressed most of them in black wax, but they also would do some in colored wax, whatever they kind of had. If they had a lump of yellow or green or red, there was no set amount to my understanding. It was more a case of 
if they had some blue left over and they were doing whatever particular record, maybe they'd run off a few copies. And at the very end, when they had just little bits of different color wax, apparently they would throw them in a big kind of bin and um, grab a few blobs to just make a very small amount of these multi-wax ones. So these were made from leftovers. These are very rare. They've turned up more recently because what happened is all their, all their stock got sold to a friend of mine actually, who had a record store on Haight Street in San Francisco. Um, Solid Smoke Records actually, if you remember the Johnny Burnett album on that label. And my friend, Mr. Rico T, I'm sure he wouldn't mind being mentioned. Um, he wound up with a lot of the stock and I went to Rico's house a few years ago. All he had left was a few of the Elvis ones, but he did tell me some great information. I was talking to him recently actually about doing an interview with the, the one Mariano is still alive and we've been trying to set that up. He was agreeable to it and he's quite, quite old now. I think he's close to being an octogenarian. Um, talking so much, I've kind of lost the track. So um, the time period, this is something I've been told, and I, this is not confirmed. This was just something I've heard. There's a lot of Mariano stories that are kind of almost like urban myths. Um, I don't know if they're true or not, but something I was told is when you look at the, this one, for instance, um, Schoolhouse Rock by Billy Harlan has issued 1973 in the Dead Wax. And I was told these dates are not accurate, and they were kind of, these were somewhat illegal, obviously. Now, there weren't that many people chasing royalties for some of these records. I mean, Billy Harlan is on the scene now. He might have something to say about it. But, um, you know, I think what I heard is if they pressed a record in like 1976, well, if they put issued 1973 on there and it came to the attention of anybody who might be going, hey, when someone has, you know, counterfeited this, Oh, they did it three years ago. Well, we should check the pressing plants for three years ago or whatever. I think it was to throw people off the trail thinking that it wasn't a new bootleg, but something that had come out a few years ago and maybe the trail had gone cold on. I mean, I'm kind of applying some of my own logic to that. So who knows if that's different. I want to give you a comparison for a, an original and a Mariano. There are other pressings that are not Mariano. This is where it gets confusing, but th th these ones are. So there's a copy of one of my favorite records. That is Marion Madman Mitchell, not Marlon Madman Mitchell, as many people thought. Uh, my friend Volker did a lot of research and turned up some fabulous photos of him and uh, flyers for him. And his name was Marion. I wish it was Marlon, like Brando, but uh, it's just, I think it's a typo. It's actually Marion Mitchell. Um, so that's the, sorry, that's the, that's that. And that is the, is an original. So you can see, you know, the label color's a bit different, but it's pretty, they were pretty close. And the sound on them were, was fabulous. I mean, they had the mastering technology that would have been around in the 70s. And some of them um, sound, in my opinion, better. I mean, I've got an original 45 of Dale Vaughan on Vaughan, but I still keep the Mariano because it's louder. And it's the same with Dennis Herald, Hip Hip Baby. Um, I had a couple of other things I wanted to say about that. Some of them, let's try and find that Phantom one again. So. One of the things, I was talking to Mark Lamar about this, and we initially only thought of a couple of examples, but the longer we, we thought of it, the more examples we realized there was, in that they often would change the labels. And we kind of got to got used to this label design and kind of thought that was how the originals came out, but in reflect, on reflection, it's not the case. Here, here's a classic example. So the Phantom Love Me. Um, so, which has been bootlegged countless times. Also came out on a black wax version, wax version of this. Then about a decade later, there was a white promo version and a picture cover. And it was another bootleg on this label. So this has been done countless times. But in the USA, it never, ever came out looking like this. It, it might have done in Canada, I can't remember. There might have been a Canadian pressing, but that, wouldn't, that would have had different information on it anyway. The original, which I had laying around here, you know, somehow managed to discard. Oh, is it just over there? Oh, okay, well, I've put the original somewhere. Well, what I'll do instead is show you. The original would have looked like that. It would have been black dot, not like that. 
because they often would do they did a whole bunch of doo-wop and r&b records on on dot that would have come out like that and i think they used the same template for a lot of records that makes you kind of think they came out that way, but they didn't. Another example, they did um, Carry On, which I was going to sh show you there. That, that was done on Red, like that one. They also did um, Call Me Shorty by Mickey Gilly. Again, it did not look like that originally. I, I've got all these records out here. Oh, it's my old book on repros. In case you're like, why is, why is he know so much about repros? I don't. I've just been buying them a long time and collecting them a long time. They were... Oh, this is something I wanted to get across, actually, was... Well, here's the... Oh, no, okay. It was organized yesterday. Well, there's the, there's the Mickey Gilly. If you have a Mariano of that, that would be a red label one as well. Something I wanted to get across... Um, I, I didn't want to make any particular... I didn't want to make it about the rights and wrongs of bootlegs. I can tell you this. I treasure the fact that when I was a 13 year old kid, I could enjoy those records on their original labels with their A and B sides. It made me feel like I was buying the original single when it came out, because some of them I bought more than 40 years ago, you know? So to have that experience was only possible because of those bootlegs. And a lot of the artists on there got nothing at the time, and they got no royalties from the bootlegs. But what they did get was they got a lot of fans, which in the long run, I can't speak for all of them, built an underground audience, which would not have happened without the bootlegs. And many of them wound up getting some, I mean, Art Adams is a great example. He's a guy I still speak to, he's still on Facebook, he still plays rockabilly, you know? <laughs> he's been playing it since the 50s. And both of his records were heavily, heavily bootlegged. And he got nothing for that, but, He's now been playing at least 10, 15 years to my memory. The rockabilly circuit being adored, signing autographs, people taking those bootlegs, having him sign them all the time. And he now gets to sell his own merch and have his own career because of the legacy that was built up from those things being bootlegged in the 70s. Because without those bootlegs, we wouldn't have heard them. Not for a long time. So, you know, that's what I think of those. Something else that is useful, if you are interested is buying or collecting Marianos. Um, there is something to look out for, which is very confusing and you will struggle with unless you've been looking at these things a very long time. When you make a bootleg, or make any record actually, they, actually I've done, I can show you one of mine, and mine is not a bootleg. Mine was completely legal, 100%. But this might actually, help you understand the process. So generally, so um, this is Ice Water, Living High and Wide, which I did with my friend Michelle. We got permission from Glenn Barber just before he died, and I did pay Starday slash um, Gusto Records for the rights. And when you get the records, they send you these. These are the plates. I think I got we got like 500 originally. If I wanted more, I would return these and they could use these once again to repress more copies. They call these stampers. Sarge Records famously did a load of records that people think are bootlegs, but they're not. They legally repressed their own records because they still had their stampers, which is why it's often hard to identify if it's an original or reissue, especially considering they had a bunch of original labels left. But that's another thing we can talk about in the future. Now, the Mariano's stampers also survived, and the Rockabilly ones were purchased in the 2000s, not, I need to say the 90s, I think it was in the 2000s, and reused. They were, they did a whole bunch of them again, nothing to do with Mariano, it was to do with someone else who I'm not gonna mention or name or say anything about, but they pressed them again, but they didn't have the original labels. So you see variations with different color labels like the Autrianman on a pink label. Some they did have the labels for, Bobby Swanson on Igloo, they redid commonly on Red Wax. So there's that as well. There are bootlegs of the bootleg, but they're done from the stampers, but they were done on the East Coast. And yeah, so um, that makes that throws another another wrench in the works if you're actually thinking of collecting these things. So 
How many were there? I don't know. Hundreds and hundreds. There were many, many more of the um, R&B and do it ones. That was their main focus, I think, and then they must have got some call for Rockabilly. Uh, a lot of people were very against them. Dan Coffey and Ronnie Wise of Rolling Rock Records would often run things in magazines, making reference to them and, and all that kind of stuff. And I can understand it at this time, especially considering Ronnie was trying to do things legally, you know, all these kind of things. But the legacy they have left is huge. And one of the biggest influences musically in my entire life. So uh, as far as Mariano's go, two thumbs up. I thank them for everything they did. If any artist's toes got stepped on, I'm sorry, but they provided thousands of Europeans the chance to listen to these records almost as they were originally. Was any of that relevant? I hope you found some of that interesting. Um, <coughs> At some point, I'll try and see if I can interview one of the one that remains and then make this, you know, make this more like a precursor, more like a trailer. If not, this has been G minus. This has been a long time. Look, 21 minutes. Oh, my God. Get out of here. Uh, that was my bit about Mariano. It's not to be confused with Richard Minor bootlegs. It's another story.